So today we're going to talk about something that's it's kind of fun, kind of, kind of not, um, but it's very important. And one thing on the title I should have put is commonly used psychiatric medications in children, okay, because I am very child focused. And so what's going to happen is that if you look at something on this, we're talking about meds with adults, there's usually the FDA indication, they've done all the research, there's all the studies and stuff like that. Well, what happens with a lot of meds with kids is that we use them a lot. There's not going to be FDA approval. There's not going to be all these things because what happens is, is no parents want to say, well, you know, my kids, you know, why don't you use them as a guinea pig to test this medicine and go through all these trials to get an indication or an approval. So it's very different with adults. They do all these studies to do it, whereas with kids, most of the time when we do get approvals, it's because we've had clinical data that we've used for years and years. So there's a lot of things that we'll be talking about in here that are not the FDA approved stuff because most of child psychiatry is off label. Okay, so that's why when we talk about this, you're gonna see why we do what we do and, and what we do. Um, and the disclosure thing is I always have to put that for part of the, the health science center just to make sure that you know, I, don't, I don't talk for any drug companies or any of that kind of stuff. Um, so we're gonna talk about a bunch of different categories. Okay, so these are all the different ones. Now, y'all are gonna hear one of my big biases is when we talk about things is that when you look at medications, especially for psychiatry, when they come out, we use sometimes, we use one medicine for like four different reasons. But the problem is, is whatever the first thing somebody used it for, then that's what they're gonna call it. So some of the meds we're gonna get into in like a little bit later, we talk about antipsychotics, you know, like Risperdal is a good example. Okay, we can use it for various things, but what happens is it comes out as an antipsychotic. So if I have a kid who's very aggressive, who's not psychotic, not hearing voices, and I say, well, let's use Risperdal to help with that, they're like, well, what kind of medicine is that? And I have to always do that, oh, it's an antipsychotic. And then you have to go through this whole thing about saying your kid's not psychotic, it's not that. So the names are bad, basically. And, and so they all have, they kind of, somebody described what they do, but you can use things for anxiety. So why is that not under the anti-anxiety one? You know, so there's, there's lots of, uh, stuff around there. So it's usually best to say, if you're ever you know, working with families and kids and stuff, and they're on a medicine, don't just assume that, oh, well, if you're on you know, Zyprexa, you must be bipolar or something. Always ask, why are you on this? And in my clinics, what I always do, I always ask the kid first, why are you taking this medicine? And the kid says, I don't know. Then I say, well, we need to figure out why, because you need to know if you're taking something, you need to know why you're taking it. Okay, it's just, that's that education. I wanna know, you need to know what meds you're on. Um, and so I usually have to, Tell the parents, no, wait, let them try, and we go from there. So, um, so we're gonna go all, through all these different categories. Um, some quick, some not quick. This one, when you look at comorbidities, part of the reason that, that, that I put this in here is that uh, I kind of try to be a little bit of a purist when it comes to meds with kids, is that if you don't have to use meds, don't use meds. I mean, try to look at the behavioral stuff first. Um, at our outpatient campus, if somebody comes in and a kid, if they're under five years of age, we're not going to give them a medicine until they've had at least three therapy sessions. Because I want a therapist to be able to tell me that this is not a parenting issue, this is not just a behavioral issue. Now, if they've had those sessions and they say, you know what, this kid really is, let's say he's really out of control, hyper and impulsive and dangerous, then sometimes we'll medicate under that, but only after we've had that mechanism. Um, I had somebody that came from uh, the, the kid was, was getting ready to turn six and was on six medicines when he came to me and had already had a list of failed medicines that was five. So that means over the past like year and a half with this kid, there'd been 11 medicines that he was either on or had been tried. Okay. Now what that tells me is a couple of different things. One is either we're treating the wrong thing because none of it's working or it was not done appropriately, the doses weren't working and if you're using that many meds, something's always covering something. So the reason I put the comorbidity up is that if you have somebody who comes in who, uh, let's say it's a, it's a 10 or 11 year old, okay? And they're very depressed, they're anxious, um, they also can't focus, they're very impulsive. Well, you can look and you can say, well, or and they, you know, maybe they're a little oppositional. You also say, what's the core? What's causing this? And so if it ends up, let's say that it's a kid who um, has some attention problems and over the past five years has um, developed this I'm not smart, their self-esteem's horrible, I'm just stupid, you know, I can't control what I do, and then that leads to, they have a test, so then they get this surge of anxiety because no matter how much I study, I'm gonna fail it, and that can lead to then this depression. Can, you see how it can go, everything can add on. So instead of just kind of looking in a little silo and saying, oh, you've got anxiety, oh, you've got depression, oh, you've got this, you gotta take, see how you can take those pieces and merge them together, because sometimes then instead of saying, let's treat one medicine for each symptom, 
let's see if we could say maybe there's one medicine out there that can treat the core of what was going on and then with therapy and everything else over time everything can improve so does that make sense okay so by saying that what i want you to look at is that there's a lot of things out there the one that i put in purple too is the learning disorders one out of four kids with adhd have a learning disorder so if you have a kid and you're treating them and you're like wow they're doing better with the stimulant but they're not great that's when you always have to stop and say could it be something else you know, I mean, the meds are, our meds aren't perfect, but they're pretty good for a lot of things. And the other thing about the meds, too, is that the meds don't change, okay? We change, our bodies change. And so if somebody's like, they become immune to this medicine, you know, parents say that, and I say, well, not really. If it was working at one point, there's a reason why it's not working. Did they grow? Did that, whatever we were treating at that time, did that resolve? Maybe there's a new issue. You know, I mean, you kind of got to look at it. We change. Somebody has more stress, I don't care how much uh, anti-anxiety meds they're on, sometimes huge surges of stress could overpower anything, okay? So you always wanna kinda of look at all the possible options about that. So first we're gonna start with mood stabilizers. Now, when I mentioned antipsychotics a minute ago, um, you look at, there's two groups of the mood stabilizers. There's the antipsychotic group and then there's the sort of classic mood stabilizer. We'll get to the classic ones in a minute. In psychiatry, we use a lot of the atypical antipsychotics. They came out with this with adults and so they said, why? Well, because they treat psychosis. If you actually go into your brain and, and look at the pathways that these treat, there's like four dopamine pathways kind of in your brain. That's what helps with ADHD. It also helps with psychosis. Now, the thing is, is the antipsychotic effect is one of those pathways. If you get rid of the antipsychotic effect because you're not using it, the other pathways is going to help with thinking. It's going to help with impulsivity. One or two of those pathways are not, can lead to side effects, but it's, it's not good. So that's why is that they chose it for one pathway they call it an antipsychotic but we actually use it for other stuff in child psychiatry I want one of those other pathways which is going to help more with behavior it's going to help with thinking so you look at all these medicines and there's a bunch of them okay some newer some older the only one that actually has a true indication right now is Risperdal and that's for treating aggressive behavior in kids with um, developmental disorders okay and so you can use it in there the rest of the time we use it we'll use it for bipolar disorder we're going to use it for uh, if somebody is psychotic, for aggressive, for a lot of different things. But it's a matter of which one does, it, does the person respond to. Um, the hard part is that we have good meds, but we don't always have the, the, the you know, research data to be able to tell us how can I accurately predict which medicine goes best with which kid and which symptoms. Part of that is clinical judgment. And so if you spend enough time with the kid, you start to get a good gut feeling. If you're not spending enough time with the kid, you're just then choosing a medicine, whatever you've seen before. So with a lot of these, you'll look and say, if you have a kid who's super, super sleepy all the time, you don't want to probably give Seroquel because that may make them even sleepier. So you got to think about that person and that lifestyle. Um, Zyprexa is the most likely of them to cause weight gain. So you don't want to take somebody who's overweight and put them on that one. So there's kind of differences within the the different meds um, and so we're not going to go into each one specifically but they all kind of have like different uh, uh, different ways they work and even different potential side effects so the example that I use which is will help for the whole rest of the talk with kids is I always talk about kids I say okay what kind of ice cream do you like and they say oh I love let's say chocolate and I'll say okay well I like strawberry and if their parents in there I say well what do you like and they'll say I like vanilla and I say okay so if I got one of those big five gallon things of ice cream and the kid says he hates strawberry, but he loves chocolate. If I said, if I make you eat five gallons of strawberry, are you gonna, is it gonna become your favorite? And they're like, well, no, I'm probably gonna hate it even more. And I said, well, right, so if I give you a medicine that's not your body's favorite, and I can give you as much as I want of it, it's still not gonna work, and you're still not gonna like it, right? So what happens is you gotta say which medicine fits best with which kid, which, with sim which symptoms, which their body. Some kids do well with certain meds, and they do horrible with other meds, so that's why you have to really watch it and make sure you can optimize their doses and, and get them to the right thing. So it's actually kind of very much of, a, of, an, of an art almost um, to be careful about it. Because I'm very much a believer that I don't want kids on more than two meds, if at all possible. Rarely I will have to do three sometimes. Some kids do need that. <laughs> yes, um, should it be a red flag for us if we see children on more than one of these at the same time? Yes, that is actually an excellent question. The, the way that these meds work is that even though I said that they're very different, they work very similar in the brain with certain areas of the brain. You should almost never have to use two of these at any one time. Okay? Um, there's more potential for side effects and things like that, very rarely. And I'm trying to think of, let's see, 
We do, so over at the outpatient campus, we have, I have all my residents and my students over there, and I think we do probably about 550 visits a month, and we will do nothing less than a 30 minute follow up, hour and a half evals and all that. So as you can imagine, we got a lot of docs over there working, we got a lot of people coming through there. And I would say maybe one, maybe two kids out of 550 visits will be on maybe two of these. So you see that's very low odds, and those are the ones that I'm like, I need to see this kid, not have one of my residents or one of my students see it, because that's not, it kind of gets bad medicine. More often than not, when you see that, they're on way too low of doses, and it's somebody who doesn't know about the development and the age is which doses would be kind of best for that kid. And so if you know how development and their metabolism, you can say, no, let's optimize one medicine instead of adding a second. That makes sense. So. Very rare, that, that's usually, if you see that, that usually is kind of, and, and it's one of those don't freak out and be like, oh, that's bad medicine. You know you say, you know, you talk to their physician or something, you say, can I ask you a question, why do you have them on two? Okay, and there may be a very good reason, but more often than not, it's usually that's something that, that makes you wanna ask about it. Some of these others down here too, like Safras, very new. Um, we don't use it in our clinic, it's really new out there. We just haven't used it. I, I, haven't had the need as much kind of, kind of with it, but um, Clozaril is one, is probably the most effective of all these, but it's the one that you can, your white blood count can drop down and you have to get weekly blood checks, and so I don't use that in my clinic. You have to have a specialty clinic, a Clozaril clinic to be able to do that. Um, so we don't do that. And the other is they all just kind of have their, their different ups and downs. So this is for a psychiatry cartoon, this is pretty good. It says, again with the mood swings already, what are you, some kind of bipolar bear? All right, so what do we use these for? So these ana uh, atypical antipsychotics, if you look up there, psychosis, bipolar disorder, agitation, aggression, autism, Tourette's. So do you see, you can't look at a medicine and say this is why, this, their diagnosis. If they're on Risperdal, they must have Tourette's or they must have whatever. You always have to ask, why are you doing it? Because like I said, the meds are good. They actually hit various receptors and you're like, well, which one are we hitting and, and how is it working? So. If you look there, the, the, uh, I think some of my most difficult kids to treat, usually just in general, are my developmental disorder kids, my autistic kids, um, as well as my kids who are like premature. If you get some kids who are born like 27, 28 weeks, um, those kids are very difficult to treat because as, as they're born so early, the, like their blood vessels and everything is very fragile. So sometimes they get these like tiny little bleeds and stuff in their brain and all that. So they don't always respond to the meds the way somebody else would. And my developmental disorder kids don't either. It's very interesting because my developmental disorder kids are probably my favorite kids to treat. They're also my most challenging, but, um, but they're fun. The other thing you wanna look at is that if you have a kid who can't swallow pills, you need to really think about what preparations are good. Okay, so when we're in clinic, it's so funny because Dr. Vickman and I will like, we'll, we'll be sitting there and, and we'll be talking about a medicine and also we'll both pedal, pull out our phone and we'll be looking up on Hippocrates. What all has this come in and what's it available? What are the different doses? And we always research all that because if you get a kid who can't do something, doesn't work. Actually, we had one of our kids at the Sam Ministries that, that a couple weeks ago, we put her on Concerta and she couldn't swallow the pill, it was too big. And I went through all my behavioral stuff about the pill has to climb over your tongue, which is the hill, and you need to make it a little water slide, the pill, you know, all these different things. And uh, she just couldn't do it. So we switched to a medicine that basically dissolves in water and all she has to do is drink the water. She was so excited about that. I don't have to swallow it? I'm like, no, it just dissolves in water. Put it in there, drink it. Okay, so hopefully she's doing better. I don't know, it was just Tuesday when we switched it over. So, um, so you have to find one that's gonna be in there because if the battle that you're having with a kid is not because they don't wanna take the medicine to get better, the battle could be that the, the pill makes their throat feel funny, okay? I can almost always eliminate if that's what the battle is. The, taking your meds shouldn't be a battle, okay? Because if a kid tells me, I hate taking my meds, and I said, well then do I have you on the right medicine? Okay, so you want to find ways to eliminate kind of some of that stress with families. Um, Clozaril, that's the other one I mentioned. You got to do lots of blood monitoring and kids don't like needles. Neither do I, but you know. And this one, he says, did he tell you about the possible side effects of the prescription? He says, I like them. I feel like I'm getting more for my money. And that wasn't as funny until I actually started my blood pressure and lipid meds. Then I was like, yeah, that's not funny anymore because, you know. Um, I'm not going to focus on the side effects right here too much other than I mentioned some things a minute ago. Sleepiness, some dizziness, you can get weight gain and stuff like that. If people are going to gain weight with these meds, usually it's in the first two weeks. So you really want to watch that and monitor that. 
Um, other than that, the rare ones down there is, is these can be associated with diabetes, and people are not sure why. Is it because these medicines make you put on weight, and because you put on weight, you then develop diabetes, or do the medicines actually really affect your lipids, and that could be causing um, lots of problems with your cholesterol and all that? We don't know. So what you do, the recommendations, we get blood first time, right before they take it, and then after that, about every six months or so, you just get blood, and you check it, and you watch it and stuff. If the kid's doing perfect on a medicine and their lipids or something starts to go up, there's things we can do to counter it, but you always want to be careful adding a medicine to treat a side effect because that's kind of a slippery slope. Um, kind of, so you have to balance it with the you know, risk versus benefits for the, for the kid. And then the other one is some of the um, muscle stiffness that some people may get. Typical antipsychotics, I'm not going to go into these a lot. Some of y'all who've kind of you know, been in the field for a while will recognize a lot of these. We don't use them very much. The reason that we don't use these as so much because these are dirty drugs. And there's a lot of research that comes out saying um, the effectiveness. These are as effective as the atypicals. Well, yeah, they are. They're great. I mean, they both work great. The difference is if you like look at the Haldol, and if, it's, if you take it to like a circle, the molecule of Haldol, and you look at all the receptors and things it hits, it hits about 15 different receptors. Okay? So it's a dirty drug because it's hitting other receptors which cause side effects and things. If you look at Risperdal, it may have three receptors. Okay? So it's kind of a cleaner drug, but effectiveness? they're both equally effective. Okay, they, they do great. So it just kind of depends on sometimes when you trained, does the person have insurance? Do they not have insurance? Do you need to get something that's, you know, you know, maybe one of the like $4 meds at Target and Walmart. And so that's always the stuff that you have to think about. In our clinic, you know, we're about 85% Medicaid, what we see. And being a community clinic, I mean, we have to know what's your formulary, what can you get, what can't you get? Um, and we want to make sure that we have that access easy. So some of these that you'll see, you probably won't see very many of these all that often. And these are ones that I hope usually, when these are reserved for people, they're usually for adults more so. Because with kids, we usually try the other ones first because they're, like I said, they're cleaner. And my teenagers especially, if they get a side effect, they are the first to stop. They will not tolerate a side effect. So what are we using for? Same kind of things right here. Okay, delirium, psychosis, agitation. 